Well, good morning. Welcome to Palm Sunday. I'm glad that you're here to worship with us this morning. Uh, there's a couple of announcements in the bulletin, uh, but one of the most important ones that we have coming up, I'm going to invite my friend Casey over to tell you about, and that is our Good Friday service. So take it away, Casey, please. Oh, okay. Uh, so in the past, we've had some various uh, services for Good Friday. It's been, well, we didn't have one last year. Um, so this year, we will be having a prayer walk. Um, it will not take much of your time, and it's kind of uh, led, you know, on your own. Um, we have six different rooms with different uh, kind of focuses, and you just spend a few minutes in each room um, reading. There will be a particular scripture, and then maybe something that goes along with that, and you'll read that, and then you'll pray as a family, um, as a group, or on your own. However you decide to, to approach it is wonderful. So there is a sign-up sheet just for the fact that uh, we wanted, we didn't want a lot of people to come all at once and then trying to space people out between different rooms because we're still practicing our social distancing. So um, we do not have many people signed up yet. So if you would like to come on Friday anytime between 4 and 7, we would love to have um, all of you. So sign up for a time slot uh, out at, in the foyer at the Welcome Center. Did I miss anything else? Yeah, no, that's sounds great. Oh, we do need a couple more volunteers. We could probably make do with, we have, a, we have four volunteers already. Um, we could probably make do with them, but so that those volunteers didn't have to stay the entire time, it'd be nice to divide them up and say, okay, you stay for the first hour or hour and a half, and then you're free to do the prayer walk and leave, and then someone else can come do the prayer walk and then stay and just monitor a room. It might be like touching a button to play a video or play a song or just uh, be there in case anyone has questions. So that is kind of a need still. If anyone's interested, you can contact me or Mike or Alicia. All right, excellent. So I'm excited. It'll be a, a contemplative opportunity for us to slow down from life. Mm -hmm. and spend time just reflecting on what Jesus did for us. Yep. Awesome. Yeah, so I encourage you to sign up. Thank you so much, Casey. Yep. Hey, let's pray and let's worship this morning. So God, thank you so much. Uh, thank you that we can gather together. Thank you so much for just all the different people who come together to make our society, our community work and run. And uh, we thank you for the, the, the medical teams. We thank you for the, the police and the fire and and those who run the grocery stores and the gas stations, and, and we're all connected together. And we thank you for how that works. And we thank you for how you, you put us in different areas. And as ambassadors for you, as people who represent you, I pray that we will do a good job, that we will shine the light of your sun wherever we work, and that people will see the hope that we have, and that's your, your son, Jesus Christ. Our Savior. God, I pray that as we worship today, that we can find the same joy and enthusiasm that those early believers did, that they had as Jesus came into Jerusalem. But God, I pray that we will have that joy and that encouragement and that is enthusiasm for the right reason, because your Son is our Savior from our sins. We love you, Lord. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. And uh, good morning. Welcome to Defiance Christian Church. Let me invite you, if you're able, to, to please stand with us. And as Mike said, we're going to worship this hour, uh, but we're going to start off with some songs. You unravel me with the melody. You surround me with a song of deliverance from my enemies. Till all my fears are gone And I'm no longer a slave to fear I am a child of God And I'm no longer a slave to fear I am a child of God but 
But when the set time had fully come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those under the law, that we might receive adoption to sonship. Because we are his sons, God sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, the spirit who calls out, Abba, Father, you are, so you are no longer a slave, but God's child. And since you are his child, God has made you also an heir. From my mother's womb, you have chosen me. Your love has called my name. I've been born again into your family. Your blood flows through my veins. I'm no longer a slave to fear. I am a child of God. I'm no longer a slave to fear. I am a child of God. My songs of deliverance, we've been liberated from our bondage, we're the sons and the daughters. So today is Palm Sunday, and it's the day that, that we celebrate the triumphal uh, entry into Jerusalem. As Jesus rides into Jerusalem on the colt, I mean, one that had never been ridden before, and all of the people in Jerusalem gather around, and all of the people are shouting Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest, and they're waving palm branches, and they're putting palm branches on the ground, and they're putting their coats on the ground. And right now we've got um, our youth uh, they just kind of want to embody that this morning. your name. 
to the King of Kings. Lord, we lift up your name with hearts full of praise. Be exalted, O Lord, my God. Glory to the King of Kings. Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna in the So this next one is, is a new song. It's called Evidence, uh, and it's extremely fitting for this time of year. Uh, it's a fitting for every time, uh, but as we approach this week of passion, as we approach uh, Friday, Good Friday, and then Sunday, an even better Sunday, right, where Jesus is in the empty tomb, has left the empty tomb. And so we're going to be singing this song this week. We'll be singing it next week. And again, that's so we can learn it, so we can know it, so that we don't have to necessarily think about the words, but that we can sing it as a praise. Though all throughout my history Your faithfulness is what beside me No winter storms made way for spring Every season from where I'm standing, I see the evidence of your goodness all over my life, all over my life. I see your promises in fulfillment all over my life, all over my life. Come to fear will leave. You lead my heart to victory. You are my strength, and you always will be. I see the evidence of your goodness all over my life. All over my promises in fulfillment all over my life, all over my life. See the cross, the empty grave, the evidence is endless. All my sin rolled away because of you, oh Jesus. See the cross, the empty grave, the evidence is endless. All my sin rolled away because of you, oh Jesus. Oh, I see the evidence of your goodness all over my life, all over my promises in fulfillment all over my life, all over my life. I see the evidence of your goodness all over my life, all over my life. I see your promises in fulfillment all over my life so why should I fear oh the evidence is 
You hold my every moment You calm my raging seas You walk with me through fire And heal all my disease I trust in
You're more than enough for me. Jesus, you're all I need. Let's be seated and celebrate communion together. I was going to do the communion meditation today from Psalms 8-4, and then after I thought about what week it was and what was going on, I thought uh, it would be great to do this to probably the most recited verse in the Bible. Unfortunately, it's probably not the most thought about verse in the Bible, and I wished it was. John 3:16, and Wednesday night at practice, Jeremiah so much put it to me, says, and it's also so sad that we never follow that with John 3, 17. So why don't we read that now? For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whosoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Now, as we come into this week of... Uh, the last week before Christ had our salvation given to us. And we're sitting here and thinking about communion. We might think of things like his triumphant entry. In, yeah, I'm as bad as Jeremiah with that, aren't I? His triumphant entry into Jerusalem. We might think about his anguish at the money changers. We might think about him in Gethsemane. We might think about the beatings the whippings, we might think about the spitting on him, the cursing, making him into a beast of burden to carry the implement of his murder through the streets and finally actually committing that murder upon him. Of course, we're lucky enough to know that three days later, he rose defeating earth with our salvation in hand. So why would a God that owes us nothing less than death. And I imagine if we could think of something worse, we'd probably get that. Why would he come down and let the very people he was trying to save do all this to him? And then in the end result, still save us all. It's simple. Because he loves us. With a perfect, unending, unswaying love that endures forever. He wants us at the end to be able to be in his kingdom with him, to go home. So today while you're holding that host and you're thinking of certainly what are good things to contemplate on, the suffering that he went through for us, it's quite also just as important that we contemplate the reason why he did. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much so much for thinking enough of us that you would do all these things let yourself put be put through all these things just to save us from ourselves so that we could be with you for all eternity we pray all these things in your son's glorious name amen
we come to this <clears throat> time of offering, you know, whether it be online or in the box, you know, I, I know that you have heard so many times that we try to be good stewards over your, your gifts, where they go, what they do. And I'd like to take a chance right now and explain to you and remind you, if you don't know, the miracle God does with your gifts. Because you see, he takes something as earthly as currency, and how much more earthly does it get than money? And by use of your heart, he turns that into a kingdom that will stand and last forever. And the real neat thing about that is, is once that's all completed, he invites you to stay with him in that kingdom for forever. Rent free. Pretty cool. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the ability to get money that we can steward over it and give what we deem back to your kingdom. We pray that someday, when it's all finished, that we will rest there in heaven and know that we did the right things by you. We pray these things in Jesus' holy and his everlasting name. Amen. Well, I'm excited to look out and see people in the sanctuary, okay? Because it was a year ago, March 22nd, 2020. It was a year ago that I started preaching to an empty room. I, I never took a class at college uh, on how to be a televangelist or an internet sensation. Probably explains a lot. I haven't <laughs> achieved either of those two. Um, but I'm, I'm, I much prefer this, okay? This is, this is, this is good, and this is, this is where we're, we're taking steps. We're going, we're going in the right direction. We're going to get through this, and we're going to get through this stronger. Um, if you've got a Bible, we're going to go to Luke chapter 19, Luke chapter 19, verse 29. But, but as you're going there, I want to encourage you, we're going to get through this, okay? And, uh, and I'm, reminded, I'm reminded that as you're looking that up, um, I'm reminded of the importance that we get together as believers. Let us consider how we may spur one another on towards love and good deeds through internet-based Bible studies. That's not what it says. That's not what it says. Not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another all the more as you see the day approaching. That a meeting together, that's from Hebrews 10, meeting together and encouraging one another in love and good deeds. I mean, there's something about seeing Fellow believers, I, I, I really appreciated the other day, I, uh, someone from the worship team pulled their mask down, gave me a little smile, and it, it was just, it was, man, you, there's just something about your face, and okay, we're getting there, we're getting there, we're going to get through this, I'm going to pray, we're going to get through this, so God, I pray, I pray that we will not miss another Palm Sunday, another Easter, that we will be able to be together that we will be able to, um, to meet together. I, I, I love Matthew 16. Nothing can stop the church. Nothing can stop it. You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. So we're here today. We'll be here next week. We will continue to meet. We will continue to be together. So God, I pray that you will be with us this morning, that you will encourage us, and that we will find the same joy and excitement that those early believers had. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Now, and we've been talking about this a lot, but I want to give you a quick last little update here, and then we're going to jump into the word. Orange. We are looking for orange. And the, the Ohio orange, red, orange, yellow COVID chart was messing with me on Thursday, okay? And, and Alicia can attest to that, all right? Because at 2 o'clock, we both, like hawks, are staring at the red, orange, yellow uh, map. And they're supposed to update it at 2 o'clock. And at 2 o'clock, we got the spinning wheel of thinking, I'm like, you got to be kidding me. Your server is down, and it's got this yellow ribbon that's like, we don't know what's going on, just wait. I'm like, that's what you said all last year. We don't know what's going on, just wait. And, and so, okay, so finally they updated it. Now I'm going to give you a quick snapshot of what it looks like. Okay, so five weeks ago, the metric that kept us in red 
was the cases per 100,000, and we were at 196. Next week, we're at 165, 154, 133. This week, we're at 120. So it's coming down. It's coming down. 11s, 20s, 13s, it's coming down. Once we get under 100, we'll be there. And I'm seriously, if it's like 100.01, I'm going to call DeWine. What, what, I, I make idle threats a lot, okay? We got to get down below 100,000, uh, be below 100, at 100,000, then we'll switch to orange, and then we will wisely and smartly uh, fire a bunch of stuff back up. Okay, we're going to get our, our Sunday school program going again. Junior church is going to be going again. Uh, youth group is going to be going again. We're going to get those programs going again. But we got to, that, that was the thing that we chose. We said we got to get back to orange. Once we get back to orange, then we can responsibly restart this thing. And so that's what we're, that, that's what we're, we're, we're wait, waiting, waiting for. Okay, so um, we just need to pray harder, Right? Pray hard. Just get this out of here. Let's get back together. Okay, so we are in uh, we are in Luke. That's where you're at. Luke chapter 19. Young people, young people, you did an excellent job. Give yourselves two thumbs up, two bonus thumbs up. You did a great job waving those palm branches. I was watching for the palm leaf slap, uh, which none of you did, and I'm giving you that idea now because you'll forget about it next year. Uh, and way to say no to temptation. So good job. Um, but that was, that was good, and that was appropriate, because that's what, that's what the people did when Jesus came into town. Luke chapter 19, we're going to read the story, and then we're going to do some, some, some context. So we're going to read the story, and then we're going to talk about why it's so important. Um, so Luke chapter 19, uh, as they, verse 29, as they approached Bethpage from Bethany at the hill called the Mount of Olives, He sent two of his disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and as you enter it, you will find a colt tied there, which no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. Now, I don't know if you've ever ridden a horse. Who's ever ridden a horse or a donkey? Have you ever ridden a horse? Have you ever ridden a donkey? Any any donkeys? Oh, all right. Sorry. Anybody who's ridden a donkey? (laughs) I'm a donkey. I have never ridden a donkey. I have ridden a horse. But the horse that I did ride was very tame and domesticated. Um, I'm kind of adventurous, but I don't think I would go just hopping on a horse that's never been ridden before, especially for my grand entrance into the city. What's the best thing you got here? How about this wild, unridden colt? I'll take it. It's cheap. Yeah, I, this is, but this is what Jesus is doing. If anyone asks, verse 31, if anyone asks you, why are you untying it? Say, the Lord needs it. Those who were sent ahead went and found it just as he had told them. And as they were untying the colt, its owners asked him, why are you untying the colt? And they replied, the Lord needs it. And they brought it to Jesus, threw their cloaks on the colt, and put Jesus on it. And as he went along, people spread their cloaks on the road. When he came near the place where the road goes down, at the Mount of Olives, the whole crowd of disciples began joyfully to praise God in loud voices for all the miracles they had seen. Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory on the highest. If you look in the other gospels, Matthew, Mark, and John, they use the word Hosanna, the word Jeremiah talked about earlier, the Hebrew word for saves. And they said saves. They said uh, the king is coming. They were really excited. They joyfully praised God because Jesus was coming into town. But let's dig into this because there's more than just Jesus randomly riding into town on a colt on some random day. This whole story is loaded with perfect timing. Jesus knows what time it is, where he's at, and where he's going to intentionally proclaim that he's the king. Jesus chose to show the world that he was the king at Passover time in Jerusalem. If you take a note, young people, Jesus chose to show the world that he was the king at Passover time in Jerusalem. Now, Passover is the Jewish celebration. Uh, Jeffrey Wigger uh, writes about this. He says it was the most significant event in Israel's history, the Exodus. It's when they left from Egypt. If you remember, they were kept as slaves in Egypt, and they were forced to work hard. And Moses came and said, God said, let my people go. And Pharaoh said, not by the hair of my chinny chin chin. That's not exactly what he said, but he said no. And, um, and so God taught Pharaoh some lessons through plagues. But Pharaoh's heart was hard. And they put up a big fight. But eventually, 
he, he succeeded, or he let them go. Um, and so Passover is a celebration of that exit, exit out of Egypt. Uh, it's celebrated on the 15th of the first month of Nisan. Uh, later, um, that month is March or April to our calendar. Um, after Passover day, it would be a seven-day celebration uh, of the Feast of Unleavened Bread to remind them of the speed at which they left Egypt. We got to get out and we got to go now. And so they didn't have time for the bread to rise, so they baked it without using yeast. Um, and so the name also corresponds Passover. It corresponds to what happened during the 10th plague. If you look back to your Old Testament Hebrew, when, when Moses was talking to Pharaoh and saying, hey, you got to let my people go. And Pharaoh's like, I'm not going to do that. And Moses is like, well, how do you like flies? Pharaoh's like, you're not going to do anything with flies. Moses is like, my God will. How do you like frogs? Well, I don't like frogs either. And he just keeps bringing the plagues. And Pharaoh really has a hard heart. And on the 10th time, God says, that's it. He says, I'm going to send my angel over Egypt. And the firstborn in every household is going to die. Unless the Passover lamb is, is slain. And the blood from this pure, innocent, perfect lamb is spread on the doorpost and on the top of the doorframe. If there's the blood applied to the doorpost and the doorframe, then the angel will pass over and the firstborn's life will be saved. And so this is the time that Jesus is riding into Jerusalem. So they're all celebrating Passover. They're all celebrating an exit from slavery because of the blood that was slain by the perfect lamb. And so we have the, the, this. You talk about a, a type uh, from the Old Testament to the New Testament, something symbolic of something coming from the Old Testament to the New Testament. This is perfect. Jesus knows what he's doing. You've got, you've got Jerusalem is packed. All Jewish males over the age of 12 were required to go to Jerusalem for Passover. So Jews from all over the Roman Empire were gathered together to celebrate this. They're loaded in Jerusalem. So there's massive crowds, massive popularity. Uh, if you remember, we're in March or April, sometime in there. And in January, Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead. And I really appreciate in the book of John where it talks about the, the people coming to Jerusalem. And they wanted to see Jesus because of the miracles that they had seen him do. Miracles are a way that God uses to authenticate his messenger. And in the book of John, they talk about Lazarus, that they want to see Jesus because he raised Lazarus from the dead, and they want to see Lazarus. And I feel bad for Lazarus, because I can only imagine people are like poking him. He's not real. Is he real? I dare you to poke him. Poke him. He's a ghost. He's not a ghost. I saw him eat something. Ghosts don't eat things. And, and so Lazarus is there, and they're trying to peek at Lazarus and look at him and look at Jesus, and the popularity is growing and it's at this time that Jesus comes into Jerusalem because Jesus is our Passover lamb. Jesus is our Passover lamb. If you take a notes, that's number two. Uh, he is our perfect, spotless lamb. Earlier I mentioned when they celebrate Passover meal before the angel of death came in the plagues in Exodus. They had to take that perfect lamb, sacrifice that lamb, and apply that blood to the door frames of the house. This is, this is the type, the symbol a special kind of symbolism, something in the Old Testament that represents something to come, a symbol of who Jesus is and what he will mean for us. When we remember at the beginning of the book of John, when John the Baptist see Jesus, sees Jesus, he says, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. What a perfect assessment of Jesus. If you've got your Bible, we're in Luke. Go over to 1 Corinthians chapter 5. We'll come back here to Luke in a second. 1 Corinthians chapter 5. We're, we're, we're doing some context because it's not just Jesus walking into a town. Oh, where am I going to go today? Uh, Jerusalem? Yeah, sounds like a good idea. I think they got a sale on pierogies. I don't know if they had those back then, but maybe. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, chapter 5, verse 7. This is Paul writing here. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7. Get rid of the old yeast so that you may be uh, so that you may be a new unleavened batch, as you really are. We're in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, and the end of verse 7 here. This is Paul writing, For Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. Paul specifically identifies Jesus Christ as our Passover lamb. He is the perfect, 
mature, sinless lamb that was slain for us. And so the symbolism of it is just absolutely perfect. Jesus chose to come into town on Passover because he was fulfilling the, the type, the symbol of Passover through himself. You think of the, the, the Passover, the Old Testament one. It's when the Israelites were freed from, from slavery. Now, why did Jesus come? To free us from slavery. You might say to yourself, well, I'm not a slave. Prior to salvation, we were a slave to sin. And we could do nothing to free ourselves from that sin, except for the blood of Jesus Christ applied to our hearts. You think of the, um, the celebration of Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread. They were commanded to eat a very specific meal to remember the day of Passover, just like Christians are called to remember the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus through the bread and juice, through communion, that specific meal that we have. And then when we think of the words, Hosanna, now the, the, the verse that we're looking at here back in Luke, Luke chapter 19, I mentioned earlier that this story is told in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and John, all four Gospels include this story, and the other three, the other three use the word Hosanna. Hosanna is a Hebrew word that means save us. And the people are really excited, they're so excited. Uh, Luke chapter 19, verse 37, when they came near the place of the road, where it goes down to the Mount of Olives, the whole crowd of disciples began joyfully to praise God. Loud voices for all the miracles they had seen. They were so excited. And they said, Hosanna, our, our, our king comes to save us. Because they wanted to be saved. And I have to ask, for what reason? They wanted to be saved from their political oppression. They wanted an earthly king. They reflected on what happened way back in the Old Testament. It's good for us to know about the Old Testament because it points towards Jesus. They wanted this king that's mentioned in 2 Samuel verse, uh, chapter 7. Your house and your kingdom will endure forever before me. Your throne will be established forever. They, they remember that and they said, that's the king that we want, the king whose throne will last forever. The king who will get these oppressive Romans off our back. That's the saving that we want. That's what we think we need. It's like when we ask our parents to save us from vegetables. It's like, no, that's what you need. That's good for you. <laughs> Sometimes um, people ask me to help them pick things up at, at, at Walmart. I think it's because I'm tall. You know, hey, can you get that? Sure, not a problem. So I, I get it down. And uh, this little old lady, hey, can you get that? It was on the bottom shelf this time. And I'm like, oh, that's a long way down. So, but she was getting a bag of pork rinds. She was so excited about her barbecue pork rinds. And I thought, barbecue pork rinds? She's like, these are the good ones. <laughs> I thought, we ate whatever. But I'm thinking, um, yes, so, so vegetables are good. Pork rinds are probably not that high in nutrition or fiber or anything except taste, uh, but nevertheless. So, so we think, oh, save us from these vegetables, these peas and these lima beans and this character that it's developing within us, but save us from those things, but that's not really what we need to be saved from. And it's even more so when we think of the people in Jesus' time who were so excited, yes, save us from these political bullies. And Jesus says, maybe I could save you from your sin. That would be a much, a much better idea. A much better idea. We'll look at that here in a second again because that, that's the point. And a lot of these people here miss that point. But there's something important about Jesus coming in on the donkey. There's something important. And we're in Luke, and I'm so proud of you for looking these verses up. We're going to go from Luke. We're going to go to a book called Zechariah. That's an Old Testament minor prophet. Minor prophet means they're small. Guess what? The major prophets, they're bigger. It's pretty easy, right? So Zechariah. So if we're in Luke, we're going to go to the left. If we go to the left, one will be in Mark, then we'll go to Matthew, then we'll go to Malachi, then we'll be in Zechariah. So it's just a couple books to the left. Zechariah, chapter 9, verse 9. So I'll flip over there. Oop, I made it to Zephaniah. That's the wrong one. Zechariah, chapter 9, verse 9. So we were in Luke. So if you're going to the left, you're going to hit Mark, then Matthew, then Malachi, then Zechariah. Just a couple pages to the left. And we're going to pick up the reading in chapter 9, verse 9. Because this is, this is where God inspired the Old Testament prophetic prophets to write things down that would come true when Jesus was here. And so Zechariah chapter 9, verse 9, reads this. 
Rejoice greatly, daughter of Zion. Shout, daughter of Jerusalem. See your king comes to you, righteous and victorious, lowly and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. Get excited when you see the king coming. Rejoice, number three. Rejoice, here comes your king. When you see him come in, lowly and humble, riding on a donkey, on a colt, that's the one. That's the king. That's the one that you've been waiting for a long, long time. All the way since, since 2 Samuel, which is like way back here. That's a lot of pages of the Bible that they've been waiting for this king. They have been anticipating this king. How many of you have ever made a countdown for Christmas? Anybody ever made a countdown for Christmas? How many of you have made a countdown for spring break, Christmas break, school to start again? Parents? Amen? No? No? All right. Maybe not. Uh, but, we, but we make these countdowns for things that we're excited about. The challenge for the Israelites is they didn't know when it was going to happen. They didn't know. They were just hoping, maybe, maybe this is the guy. And they're seeing the attention being drawn to Jesus. And then he gets the colt. And he rides into Jerusalem. And I could just see him. Hey, this matches with the Old Testament. This matches with that. This, this is the one. This is the king. He's coming. Our king is here. And they get really excited. And I wonder if we are that excited about Jesus that excited about Jesus? Are we so pumped up and excited that we can't stop talking about Jesus? That there's a smile. I was working on some, uh, some, some selfies. Let me say that again. I was working hard on some selfies uh, because it's challenging. Some of you are like, first try, and you're like, wow, that's great. Me, 17th try. Still not working. Okay, it, it just doesn't work. Okay. And, and, and I'm trying and I'm trying, and I sent them all to my wife. And she's like, that's the best one. I'm like, look, I'm, do, I'm doing my best here, okay? And, and I took a screenshot of like all the selfies I sent, and I sent them to her. I'm like, look, they're all the same. And she's like, your face is crooked. I'm like, yeah, I know. That's it's just, it's me. It's, that's the best thing I got. Okay, so, so, so there were myself, because I was in my office, and I'm just... Okay, Alicia needs a photo for the web page. And I'm trying. And so, so that, that was me trying to smile and be excited. Now, fast forward a couple weeks, and um, I was out riding my bike. Did a couple miles in Fort Wayne. Stuck my foot in a freezing river. I didn't fall. It was good. 13 miles. My foot is not frostbite. But it was a good time. I had a good time riding my bike. And every once in a while, I'd snap a quick selfie and send it to my wife so she knew where I was. So in case I fell into a bigger river, she could find me, okay? And, and she commented on the selfies. She goes, you're smiling. You look like you're enjoying your life. And I was like, that's the same smile. And she goes, no, it's not. You got to do that one for the church one. I'm like, but I'm in my office. It's, it's not like, yay, office. But she's like, that's, that's the joy. I see it in your face. Make that happen. I'm like, I'm trying. I'm forcing this smile. It's like, you smile for this Christmas picture because you're, yeah, it's one of those pictures. So are we excited about Jesus? Rejoice, here comes your king. Are you just excited? We get to be together for Easter. Amen? That's cool. We missed it last year. We missed it last year. When's the last time you missed an Easter Sunday? Um, birth, maybe? Like, it's been so long since we missed Easter Sunday. And we get to be excited about this. This is good stuff. And, and I, I, I love our story. So, so the king's coming in. The people are excited about the king coming in. They're waving their palm branches. And we're going to go back to Luke chapter 19. The king's coming in. And, and I, I, I like how Jesus talks to his disciples at the beginning. He says, okay, guys, listen. This is what we're going to do. We're going to go into, into, um, into Jerusalem. We're going to go to Bethany. Um, and, and he says to him, he says, go to the village. This is Luke 19, verse 30. Go to the village ahead of you, and as you enter it, you'll find a colt tied there, which no one's ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. And if anyone asks you, why are you untying it? Say, the Lord needs it. And those who were sent went ahead and found it, just as he had told them. They just did it. They just listened. They, they obeyed. Quick, extravagant obedience. The Lord needs it. They did exactly what he said. And when the people who owned the colt, I can only imagine, um, that's not yours. Excuse me. Uh, this is like Grand Theft Auto, um, but you know, it's a, you'll get it later. And, and they're untying the colt, and the owner asked them, 
why are you untying it? And the response is, the Lord needs it. Now, I tried that yesterday at Best Buy, okay? (laughs) (laughs) I guess with plasma screens, it doesn't work. But nevertheless, okay, it was an attempt. Please don't follow that, okay? Um, But they just say, look, the Lord needs it. And, and, And so Jesus looks at his disciples and says, I need you to do this. And they go, okay, we'll do it. And the people who own the cult are like, what are you doing? And they're like, Jesus needs it. And they're like, all right, all right. We're, we're, we're on board with that. And Jesus says, I need you to do this. And we go, well, you know, that's going to be difficult. That's going to be challenging. It's going to take me out of my comfort zone. I really don't want to. And we make all these excuses. Quick obedience. I remember a, a saying from elementary school, delayed obedience is disobedience. And I never really understood it. Delayed obedience is disobedience. And then I had children. Well, and then I got married and my wife looked at me and said, delayed obedience is disobedience. Because when they have a postmark date by those Menards rebates, I hope they will take it a couple days late. But nevertheless, I forgot about it. Come on, give me some grace. But delayed obedience, I, I put it off and I procrastinated and God says, what are you waiting for? Just do it. Quickly. Obey. Why? Because I asked you, if anyone would come after me, take up your cross daily and die to yourself. Today? You mean that? Yeah, today. Do it, do it quickly. And then there's a big word in the middle of that, that sentence. If you're taking notes, young people, you see that word extravagant? Extravagant? That's a, that's a big, that's like a big church word. If you use that in, in uh, wow, if you use that in Scrabble, that's more than seven tiles. So clearly you're cheating. Um, but nevertheless, well, I guess you could build off extra and just put there. Yeah, anyways, you figure it out. Extravagant is a, is a fancy word for something that's um, over the top. It's where you're not holding back. It's where you go above and beyond. Like my birthday was a couple weeks ago. And so some of you sent me cards, and that was really appreciated, encouraging cards. That was appreciated. I didn't expect those, but I appreciated those. Now, if you had gotten me a brand new 770 horsepower Lamborghini Aventador SBJ Roadster, that would have been extravagant. <laughs> it had been a little bit over the top. Okay, I'm okay with the cards. I don't need the new Lamborghini. I don't know what I would do with that. I'd sell it as quickly as I could. But I, that, that's way over the And this is what the people do. When Jesus comes in, they go extravagant. They go over the top. They take their coats off. And they put them on the ground. And they praise him. And they cut the branches. And they wave the branches. And they're excited. And they're extravagant. In their worship of Jesus. Not just, oh, hey, Jesus. All right, cool. They're going crazy about Jesus. And I think of the quick, extravagant obedience that the Lord needs, that he asks us to give. He doesn't need it in as much as the fact that he will cease to exist. He doesn't get it or he'll be, he'll be bummed, but it's more so it's for our hearts because he knows that we need to follow him in that manner. Quick, extravagant obedience. And I love the idea of of the Lord needs it. And I think of myself, and I think of what I need. I need to have quick, extravagant obedience to my Lord and Savior. But that last part there, I need my Savior. I need Jesus to take away my sins. I need Jesus to take away my sins. If you're taking notes, circle that need word. Underline it. Make it big and bold. Because that's a problem that I can't solve, that you can't solve, that none of us can solve on our own. We couldn't do that. And so when the people are excited, they're like, hey, our king is coming to save us from oppression. And Jesus is like, close, oppression from sin. That's why I'm coming. Because that's a problem that you can't figure out on your own. And I think of Easter, I think of Palm Sunday, and I think of my Savior who came to save me for my sins. That's the good news. That should make me excited. That should make me want to take my coat off and lay it down and give my life to Jesus Christ because of what he did for me. Amen, church? Amen. Let's pray. God, thank you so much. Thank you for your son. Thank you for the gift that we find in him. Thank you for salvation. Thank you for forgiveness. God, I pray that we will apply his blood to our lives. And I thank you for the biblical assurance that because of the blood of what he shed, his perfect sacrifice, we're forgiven. We love you, Lord. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.
I need Jesus to take away my sins. I encourage you to examine that, that, that proposition, that gift. Jesus, would, he, he, did, he did all the work. He will take away your sins if only you will call upon his name. I pray that you'll do that today as we stand and sing our song invitation. Let's stand. a week where the world kind of pauses, a week where the world knows that something's about to happen, that we can take this time, that we can talk openly to those around us about what Palm Sunday is, what Resurrection Sunday is that we can be excited. Lord, you are good, and we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Have a great week.